to see you guys. So good to see you guys. Um, we are just, first and foremost, just so excited to get Blexit back on the road, especially after COVID. Um, it just, we just had to shut down, and we felt that our message in terms of healing the race relations in this country right now has never been more important um, because we just can see that the left is constantly harping and trying to tear people apart based on the color of their skin. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, just the background of Blexit and how it got started. Um, it is a play off of Brexit, the British exit. I was backstage at CPAC in 2017, 2018, and I saw Nigel Farage and I looked up and I was like, oh, that's the uh, Englishman, that's the leader of Brexit. And just like that, I went, that's exactly what we need in America. We need a black exit. Um, and what I was referring to when I had that idea is not necessarily even an exit from a party, but an exit from the ideology that seeks to make so many people believe um, that all of their attributes are assigned to them at birth based on the color of their skin. And now I think more than ever, when you talk about critical race theory, which is happening in school, which is literally teaching children to judge themselves based on their skin color, when we all know that children don't think like that. Children don't think about race. Uh, children don't think about color. Um, we, we especially noticed it in the 1619 project that they tried to perpetuate, uh, trying to make everything about slavery. It's why I was against and spoke out against the minting of Juneteenth as a federal holiday, uh, because we know what that was really about. That's not about anybody trying to celebrate the end of anything. It's about constantly trying to remind black Americans that they're victims, while at the same time constantly trying to furnish the idea to white Americans that they're guilty and they'll forever be guilty. Um, and that's horrible. That's a horrible, horrible thing. And so... In putting Blexit together, we wanted to change that conversation and really talk about true black history first and foremost. Uh, and anybody who knows true black history knows that all progress that we've had in this country did not happen because black Americans got together and said we want to be by ourselves. It got together because people like in this room, black people and white people came together and wanted to see the world actually go forward, right? <laughs> So I first wanna to talk to you about lockdowns because I think it is actually really important to have that current conversation about lockdowns. I was on stage the other night in San Diego and I was telling them about the most unusual phone call I'd ever received. Um, it was after I got into a Twitter spat, I do that often, um, <laughs> with uh, Sam Harris. Sam Harris is a podcaster. I haven't actually, I, I know he's, he's a big podcaster, people love his stuff. I think he's got some great ideas. Um, and when COVID-19 hit, he, was instantly like locked down America. And I, of course, was like, under no circumstances should we ever be locking down um, the country, especially the federal government, because once they do it once, they can do it twice, three times, four times. Once you give them that permission and that power, um, they will always execute that power in the future. And uh, when the government takes power, they never freely give it back, right? They assume that that's now a part of the powers that they have. And I was obviously a vocal critic of lockdowns. Um, and so he and I got into a little Twitter spat and then a friend in between us said, you guys should actually get on the phone and talk. And and I remember I was getting off of a plane in Texas, Austin. I mean, in Austin, Texas, and I was about to speak, and Sam Harris gave me a phone call, and he sounded like he was in a bunker, legitimately. Um, and he was like, you don't understand? He's like, Candace, you, you, you have to understand, you, you, what you are tweeting will get people killed. You know, that's very extreme rhetoric. I don't think 120 characters will kill people, but you never know. Um, and uh, I was listening to this genuine fear in his voice. He was like, there's gonna be gurneys on the street. We are all gonna get hit. Like, you know, he had really bought into the media narrative that we, none of us were gonna survive this. And um, I listened to him and I realized that this, he had accepted this reality. He had accepted that we were all gonna die. He's like, I don't want my kids outside. You need to get inside. You know, I've got friends. And he kept talking about his doctors and physiologists explaining that like, this is it. Like, this is the apocalypse. And I sort of uh, put him on mute and looked over at my husband and I said, he sounds out of his mind. Like, this man sounds really crazy. And so, but then I humored him. I said on the phone, oh yeah, okay, great, thank you. I'm glad you gave me this education and it's very smart of you to call me and say this and I understand and of course I'll be very serious about this and I will too get into my bunker and uh, not come out. And then we hung up the phone and then I instantly went inside and did an event and shook hands and hugged and didn't really care much about the COVID-19 thing. And what I realized afterward 
was that Sam Harris, for those of you that don't know, and I think the reason why I'm telling this story is not to shame him in particular, because he seems like a decent enough guy, but Sam Harris is um, an avowed um, uh, atheist. He's, he, is, he does not believe in God, and that's a part of his platform, and he talks about why he is an atheist. And I think this is really crucial into understanding a lot about the left um, and a lot about what happened because the people that were the most terrified, the people that are still terrified, no mask mandates, people are still wearing two masks running outside by themselves, right? Um, you show me someone who's doing that and I will tell you, I always show you someone who has no belief in God um, and who genuinely believes that this is it um, and that this is, the only, this is the only chance they've got and they've got to make sure they have to fight for their life and the second you have that fear, right, that fear, of this is it, the world is gonna be over, and this is all I have is this 90 years and I have to stay alive no matter what. Fear is an emotion that is instantly, instantly allows the government to manipulate the masses, fear, right? So if they know that your biggest fear is death and that you will give up every single one of your freedoms, right, to stay alive maybe an extra day, when the funny part is, is I can guarantee you all of us are gonna die, that's a fact, right? right? But to prolong your life, right? And, and what I understood in speaking to him was that fear is actually the mechanism that the government has always used to control the masses, right? They need to constantly have an existential crisis. And, and they need to make the crisis big enough, a pandemic, it's scary, show you the death ticker, um, and that means everybody is at home and on their screens, right? So now they can, take the time to manipulate people because they know that people are not having this conversation. They're not going out with their friends. They're not eating dinner uh, with their family. You have people that didn't see their family members, <laughs> still have not seen their family members, people that missed funerals um, because they said, I just, I couldn't possibly see this family member during the pandemic, um, you know, lock themselves in, into their homes. And just imagine how much power that gave the media. Um, to their brains, to their minds, right? And then we saw more than ever at that same exact time this harping on racism, right? Because now that we've got you fearful and inside of your home, what better way than to drill into your mind that there's other fears? And that fear is white supremacy, right? And that fear is that black Americans are gonna be enslaved unless we do this. Right, and you've got people that have bought into this on both sides, and, and both parties are guilty here, right? So you have the black Americans that believed in, in the oppression, and they pick the one story in which a black man dies, and nobody looks up statistics, nobody knows anything, but oh my goodness, this person is dead, so that means racism is real. And then you have white people who have bought into that same narrative, just as guilty, and do everything they can to, you know, to alleviate themselves from this white guilt, um, and, and in so much that they will be the biggest sponsors of critical race theory, right? Interestingly enough, if you go into those board meetings and you, and, you, and you look around the room and you see who are the people that are saying, we must, must, must have critical race theory, you'll typically find a white person, which is interesting, right? That's very interesting. So the media has received a ton of power um, in the process and they've just been harping on manipulating minds and dividing people. The question is why? Right? Because sometimes you just look up and you just go, why is there just so much crazy? Why, like, what's going on? Like, everybody is upset about something all the time. Like, I just, we can't even, I miss the 90s. I always said, I'm just like, I feel like the 90s, everyone was kind of cool. And then something happened maybe in the 2000, early 2000s, and now we're at full crazy in 2021. Um, and you just never know what they're gonna be crazy about, right? So in one hand, you think you're fighting critical race theory, and then suddenly they're like, these bathroom signs, we, uh, this cannot say male and female. Like, and you're just like, what? Who was upset about the bathroom signs that this has become a number one political issue over, you know, top, top five political issue over the last two or three years has been about like, this is not an all accepting bathroom sign, and now we need the bathroom signs to say, any person who wants to can use this restroom. We do not discriminate. Like, I've seen actually these long-winded signs. I'm sure you've seen them too. And you ask yourself, what is the point of this, right? You could also just write bathroom. It has the same effect. It lets you know that any person can use it. But they want you to think and see this sign to know that there's some bigotry that you're fighting. And then you see people that are fighting um, to tell children. Children seem to now be the new target of the left, right? Like now all of a sudden they want you to think that 
children can pick their genders and they want to force this via the education system. This is scary stuff in terms of what's happening with the children. This is scary stuff and not something that any person in this room who is a parent or plans to be a parent should ignore um, because they are teaching and hypersexualizing children. When in New York City, and this is a very true story, in New York City, um, first graders were shown a cartoon and that cartoon uh, illustrated to them that it was okay for them to touch themselves and talked about masturbation, okay? First grade. They brought somebody in to do that in a sex ed wor workshop. 16-year-olds um, in New York City, also New York City, attended a school, Dalton School, $50,000 a year, so parents are paying a ridiculous price tag to have their children indoctrinated. Um, and 16-year-olds, they were juniors in high school, were taught another workshop, so the parents had no idea. That's the point. The parents are never told ahead of time. And this one was about explicit pornography. Um, they were taught about anal sex. They were taught about incestuous um, pornography. You name it. This happened in school. And what was the consequence? Parents got really upset at the administration, right? And they wrote them, and it broke in the news. It leaked to the news. Um, and appar apparently, a lot of these parents were screaming, and the administration sent an email apologizing. And they said that the workshop would no longer be taught. But they thanked the woman who taught the workshop. Her name was Justine Ang. Um, and she was allowed to sort of be on her way. Um, Justine Eng is a, my, in my opinion, a sex offender, right? She should have to register as a sex offender. Um, and parents ask me all the time, they come up to me and they say, what can we do? What can we do about all of this crazy stuff that's coming down uh, the pipeline in terms of education? And I always ask the question, what would you do if your children were being preyed on? Why, why is it that suddenly when you put the kids in school, parents don't understand that it's still a predator that's attached, attacking your child? Just because they're a teacher doesn't give them the permission to attack your child. If you were on the playground and an adult, unbeknownst to you, showed your child a cartoon about pornography, what would you do? You wouldn't call the principal. <laughs> well, you wouldn't call the principal, that's for sure. <laughs> I would call the cops. I would call the cops. And, and this is where we're at today, where actually we are recognizing that our government is controlling mechanisms through the school to raise a different generation of kids that is going to be so radically different from the upbringings that we had uh, when we were children. Add on top of that is the removal of hard academics. Kids are not learning math. In fact, I uh, just did an episode of, of my show, Candace, talking about Bill Gates funding a program um, to make it so that kids, uh, black students in particular, is, is the target of this uh, program. He says that math is racist, and what is particularly white supremacist about math is that it makes it so that children have to get the right answer, and getting the right answer is a form of white supremacy. I kid you not. This is, it's, it's laughable, and it would be funny if it wasn't true. If they weren't actively trying to push through a curriculum in which children can get a 100% on something even though all of their answers were wrong. They call this equitable math, right? So just for trying, you get an A, right? That's pretty evil. That's pretty evil because you know, of course we know, that that child is going to fail in life. And Bill Gates knows that. Bill Gates knows that child is going to fail in life. This is not about equitable math. This is about making sure that you keep children and people, the mass is ignorant, right? Over, overseas, though, in China, while our children are being hypersexualized and our boys are being told they can be women and women are being told they can be men, overseas in China, they're aggressively making sure that their five-year-olds are computing cal you know, calculus, right? And they're pushing through a program that's pro-masculinity. They want their men to be more manly. So it's interesting to realize that, that we are getting such separate educations on the West versus what's happening in the East Corridor. And there is a foreign policy perspective to all of this that people should look into, because at this moment, it is, it is completely true to say that China seeks to take over the world. It seeks to take over the world. And what better way to do it? We don't live in a time where you can roll in with tanks um, and just start murdering people. So what better way to do it than to corrode the values of an entire country? What better way to do it than to use the education 
education system uh, to manipulate children into being ignorant, right? They want stupid, ignorant people because ignorant people are emotional people and emotional people can be controlled, right? That's the entire point. That is the program to make everybody a toddler. Think about a child. Why does a child cry and scream and stomp their feet when you say, no, you can't have ice cream for dinner? Because they don't, they don't comprehend it because they're ignorant. They're genuinely ignorant. They want the ice cream, the ice cream tastes, tastes good. They rely fully on their emotions to, to navigate what they should do in life. Well, right now, we have an education system and a government that is trying to make it so that the average adult is a toddler. And they're by and large succeeding. If the George Floyd riots were any indication, they are by and large succeeding. If they were able to convince, especially in the middle of lockdowns, telling us all that we were gonna die, right, but protests were okay. Right, protests got it, actually protests are fine. Um, this is the one time we're gonna lie you outside protesting, we're gonna make sure there's no laws. We don't want you guys being arrested for protesting. Knowing that that was leading to rioting, that was leading to looting, and knowing that that was going to lead to impoverishment of the cities that the rioting and the looting was happening in. They knew this wasn't about black lives, they knew it wasn't about black lives mattering, right? If black lives matter, you wouldn't want black neighborhoods burned to the ground, right? If black lives mattered, you would have talked truthfully and honestly and critiqued the life of George Floyd who harassed and traumatized more black people during his lifetime um, than any other person that I know. I've never seen a rap sheet that long. If black lives mattered, they sure as heck didn't matter to George Floyd the entire time he was alive and selling drugs and arm robbing black Americans. But they don't want you to think, right? This is why they don't like me, because I will say that, and I will point to the obvious record and say, how can you fly the banner and use the expression Black Lives Matter and not talk about what's actually harming the black community? And I'll tell you one of the things that is harming the black community is the lies and the manipulation surrounding the idea that the government is trying to fight white supremacy. No, they are not. They are not. What they are trying to do is to perpetuate um, the exactly what they did to black Americans in the 50s to all of America, right? Black America was an experiment. Black America in the 1950s, Lyndon Baines Johnson, an avowed racist, you can read about him in, in Robert Caro's book. This is a president who said the N-word um, all the time, you know, and it, proudly he hated black people. While he was in Senate for 20 years, he voted against every single effort to give black Americans rights during Jim Crow. He was a part of the old Southern Bloc, and uh, he became president. And when he became president, there were a lot of riots happening, and he knew that he was going to be forced to sign a civil rights bill, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And he basically, when he signed it, and there is a quote that is attributed to him in that book, um, where he said, I'm gonna have those N-words voting Democrat for the next 200 years. So at the very same moment that he pretended to give black Americans freedom, he orchestrated the Great Society Act, welfareism, right? And, and this was a way to re-enslave the very same people that he had just freed. The government came and said, we'll be your family, right? We'll be your family. We, you, we have done such, so much bad stuff to you that we wanna help you, right? We're gonna give you money. If this story sounds familiar, it's because it's happening now with COVID, right? The government's gonna be your family. They care about you. They're gonna give you money. Don't go to work, right? Don't go to work, we're gonna give you money. This is the right thing for us to do because we did the lockdowns, right? Government creates the problem, lockdowns. Government creates the problem, Jim Crow laws. And government creates the solution, welfareism, each time. It's exactly what's happening right now. They're mass perpetuating it because what they did to black America, by and large, was a success in terms of what they wanted to accomplish, was, was enslaving a group of people to believe that the government was their family and wanted to help even though all they wanted was votes, right? So you look at what they did in the Great Society Act and they said, you know, don't marry, don't marry the father of your children. Yeah. The government will give you more money if you don't marry the father of your children. And that's how the single motherhood rate went from 23% in the 1960s to a whopping 74% in the black community today. 74% of black children are growing up not in a two-parent home. It's staggering. So why the attack on family? Well, if you look at everything that the left is doing today, in terms of wanting to have abortion at nine, nine months in the womb, right? In terms of every single mechanism of having children believe they can pick their gender, trying to encourage children to mutilate their bodies. What is the one thing that that guarantees? Is that those children 
will not have a productive family. They will not have a nuclear family intact because when you mutilate your body, you cannot have a normal family. There's no going back. You don't go, oh, I made a mistake in my 20s and mutilated my body and you know, now I've realized I've done something wrong. It doesn't work like that. You'll never have a normal productive family. So they learned that because they did it in the 1950s to black Americans and they knew that as soon as you break down those two pillars, first the pillar of faith, they don't want anyone believing in God, they want them to believe in government. When anything happens, they want the government should help. Well, this happened today, how is the government gonna fix this? This happened yesterday, how is the government gonna help us fix this out of COVID lockdowns? You saw so much of this, right? The government owes the, a government, the government, the government never had the right to lock you down. And now you're turning to that same government. And so it's all an attack on the family. Everything is an attack on the family. They're normalizing you not even being with your family. The government will tell you on Thanksgiving whether or not you can see your mom and dad. Think about how bizarre and crazy that is and what that's actually priming society for, totalitarianism. The government controlling every single asset and facet of your life is what it is preparing people for. And for black Americans, it meant that black Americans today and this is a very sad truth, are more impoverished than black Americans were in the 1950s under Jim Crow, right? They were, they were doing more and outpacing whites in terms of economic growth in the 1950s, and all of that stopped after the Great Society Act, when the government stepped in and the government became the family. So this is the game, this is the race game. The race game that is happening today is nothing but a distraction. Every single story that they focus on, if you even read the news, you'll be shocked. If the perpetrator is white, they do not mention, if the perpetrator is white, they do not mention, um, they do mention the race. If the perpetrator is black, they will not mention the race. They want you to always think that the bad people are white people, right? Bad people are white people because they are trying to ignite a race war. And why are they trying to ignite a race war? You go, what's the point of this? What would be the point of defund the police? Right, because divided we fall. And you would say, what is the point of them doing defund the police? That seems crazy, right? You know what, everybody who has common sense knows what that's gonna lead to. It doesn't just create a vacuous space when you defund the police. If there's no police, it's not like, oh, well then everybody just got along after the police left. The gangs step up, they become the police, right? Suddenly you're living in the land of the Bloods and the Crips and the, and the Latin Kings because people need protection. And if they need to get that protection from gang members, they'll get that protection from gang members. And that's what's happening as we look at the shootings rising in all of these inner cities by some 70%, right? People are dying on the streets. They knew that was gonna happen. But now watch, their language is changing now. They're saying, oh my God, I don't know why this is happening. What do you mean you don't know why this is happening? You guys created the problem. The government created the problem. They used Black Lives Matter riots, they used the death of George Floyd, and they wanted to make sure that the problem was policing, so that the police would be attacked and then people would demand that the police be, de be dis uh, not disbarred, uh, be dismembered, that the police unions get dismembered, they wanted nothing to do with the police unions, they want the police gone. That was the problem that they created, and what's the solution? I will bet you, pay attention, and it's going to happen. There are now going to be calls, if I am correct, you guys all owe me a Coke, <laughs> for federal police. That's where this is going to end. That is the next step in creating a totalitarian state. They need to own the police. They need to own the elections. Everything must be federal. So they're waiting until the streets get bad enough that the people that live in those streets say, we'll take anything. And they'll say, we got you. We're gonna help you. We're gonna send down some federal police to police the streets. And that's what's going to happen. We're gonna have a federal police a federal police force in this country akin to what happens in communist countries. Welfareized, people that are no longer being protected by local police because you've, you've made them the enemy and you've made them the bad guys. And that is where the country is headed right now. Most of us in this room are obviously awake to that. I think that the majority of people don't come to this event because they're not awake to that, right? Um, and so the question then becomes, what do we do to, to change the ship around, right? And the answer is that we fight every single day in every single regard that we can. If, <laughs> if 
first and foremost, um, I just want to remind you guys that the most important people, the most important elections are the local ones, the community ones, running for the Board of Education. You hear so much talk about Congress. Any person in this audience can run for, for BOE, run for those local positions, because that's where all the bad ideas are coming down, being handed down um, from the Department of Education. And that's something that we need to do to fight. So the second thing is simply do not take the bait. A game that I play is every time they show me something, the media, because I know that the media is now controlled by the state. We have state media, that's what CNN is. They are working with our government to put out and to make us feel how they want us to feel, whether that is, and that is always fearful, right? Uh, always angry and always fearful. And so you have to look at them and you have to objectively look at the media and you have to ask yourself, every time they show you something, no matter how horrific it is, pause and ask yourself, why? Why are they showing me this video? Why are they showing me this headline? What is the emotion that they want me to garner from this headline? We have to become masters of our own emotions. That's, that's a huge step in taking back our individual autonomy away from the state, is not allowing ourselves to be manipulated by them. Getting involved in elections, local elections, right? Voting, canvassing, going around, finding good candidates, finding people that understand the predicament that we're in. And again, whether you are white or black, never take the race bait because the government does not want to end racism. The government wants to renew slavery on all of its people, no matter what your color is. That is the truth. So I created Blexit because I wanted us to be a part of changing that conversation because I believe that a big reason why the government wanted to do lockdowns is because there is an awakening happening. Because a lot of people are starting to think. Because there's a lot of people that are passing around this information to a lot of other people. I think they saw those Trump rallies and thought, oh my gosh, how could this be happening? We've spent four years calling this man racist and yet he, see, he has somehow gained 10 million votes. Uh, he doubled his support amongst black women since, since he ran in 2016 and he increased his support amongst black men uh, by eight points. That represents an existential crisis for the government. That represents an existential crisis for the media because that means that people are no longer being fooled by the race narrative. It means that people are starting to think for themselves no matter what candidate you support. Um, it, it shows you that thinking, people are beginning to think and they're no longer accepting that the media tells them the truth. In fact, belief in the media is at an all-time low in this country. Right? And that is a, a benefit. And that is why they want to censor the internet. It is the reason why they want to censor me. It's the reason why they want independent journalists to go away because all they want is state, state journalism. All they want is Jake Tapper speaking and telling you what's, what's happening outside in the world. They don't even want you outside. They want to tell you what is happening outside. And so movements like this, movements like Blexit, why we hit the cities and we start this is because we know that it takes just one person to make a big difference. If you can get people in this room who, and I've had people who come to Blexit and said, Candace, I really hated you, but I wanted to hear what you had to say, right? If you can get a person to just think and consider this, right? They always say, wow, I never had that perspective. And if we have this many people in the room who can then take this perspective to the next person and to the next person, then we are a part of that awakening. We are a part of that awakening in this country that is being perpetuated. We are a part of the reason why the government wants to censor. We are a part of the reason why the government wants to have these lockdowns because too many people are alive to the truth. So our banner here, um, our, our tag, if you will, what we say is that we, we the free, we are the free here at Blexit and we will no longer be a part of the manipulated masses. Here we are in Birmingham and we have some amazing speakers tonight um, and I just wanted to step out and to just introduce you guys to what this movement is about, uh, what we believe in, what our truths are. And at the end of the day, as you saw in the video, what we believe in is love, it's that simple. We believe that what binds every single person in this room is not the color of your skin, your background, how many kids you have, it's the fact that you are an American, right? An American, America is a country. <laughs> Absolutely. America is a country where um, we are united based on our ideas, no matter where you come from in this country, uh, no matter where you start in this country. Uh, if you work hard and you stay out of, out of trouble in this society, you can make something of yourself. 
That is an American ideology. That is the American dream. You guys, welcome to Blexit Birmingham. And first, we have a video for you to show you what's been going on locally in your community. Thank you guys so much. God bless.